start now. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to have another uh, wonderful guest today, which is Marinike, um, and to hear more about uh, her experiences and particularly discuss, uh, I guess, like the diag diagnostic process that um, parents go through when, when they're told that their child is autistic. So one thing that we were talking about just before um, starting this recording is kind of how the diagnosis is delivered or how the um, kind of criteria for a diagnosis is laid out can affect parents' perception of their child. And I was just wondering kind of if you could share more of your thoughts on that and your experiences. Sure. And if I get too tangential, just kind of like, you know, you know, rail, roll me in. <laughs> um, but um, so for me, actually, it started so my um, it is my younger two children who are the autistic children in our family. Um, the others are, um, you know, neurodivergent and have other disabilities as well. But I was less familiar with autism, um, you know, I think like a lot of people. And um, for my daughter, to, you know, she was my first biological child and I was, you know, staying home with her. And so she had some, you know, she, I thought she was just brilliant and beautiful and awesome. And, um, and she reminded me a lot of myself and my niece, like in some ways, like the things that she liked to do. And so um, I felt like we really had this kind of, you know, connection, but I also wanted her to be able to, um, I guess, interact and socialize with other children. And so um, at some point I, when, when she was, when she turned two, I decided to place her in a part-time Mother's Day Out program so she could be around other children. And prior to that, she had been receiving um, services. She had um, issues with, um, she had some food intolerances. She had um, GERD. Um, and she also had um, some issues with like, you know, with swallowing and so forth. So we've been seeing occupational therapists since she was about eight months old and an allergy and immunology specialist and things of that nature. So we had EI services for that. Um, and, um, and so, and they would come into the home and work with her and then also would go to, um, a feeding clinic and they'd work with her there. And, um, we, the Mother's Day Out staff told me, um, she doesn't know her name, does she? And I was like, she knows how to read. Yeah, she knows her name. <laughs> and they were like, well, she never answers to her name. I'm like, well, she doesn't always answer to her name. And then they started mentioning all these other things that they were concerned about. And I had an answer for everything they were saying, this, that, and the other. I said, she doesn't we just talk. She just takes you somewhere when she wants something. I was like, yes, that's a lot more efficient. You know, I mean, just take you where you need it, you know, or whatever. And so they mentioned a few different things. And finally, they were like, she's really different than the other kids. Um, we're kind of concerned. And I was thinking, they're concerned. Uh, um, and so I, I didn't really understand what was going on. They were like, in her first day, she didn't even cry when you left her here. You know, most kids are really nervous and stranger anxiety and stranger danger. And she didn't even seem to know or care that you were leaving. I was like, well, no, I think she just knows that she's safe if I put her somewhere. And I had already, we'd been to the church. We attended this church and I, have you know, had brought her to meet you all and kind of look around before we started. So it wasn't strange. I just didn't understand. And so um, anyway, they, they, I, other parents were starting to arrive and drop off their children. So I didn't want to keep them. So I let them, you know, kind of go off on their own. And I decided to stay because um, usually I would just kind of hang out a little bit and then I would leave. But I said, I'm going to stay and watch like the beginning of the day and see how things go. And so I moved to off to the side, you know, to like a, there's a glass area where there's a window, but you, you have to be looking for the person to know they're there. And that way I could observe the children without them knowing that I was observing them. And so all the other, you know, two-year-olds were running around and they were throwing feather boas around each other's necks or building stuff and they were touching each other. And, and I was like, how annoying, you know? <laughs> They were so loud and look at this. And I was like, gosh, I can't entertain themselves. Like, and my daughter was sitting to the corner and there's a, they had centers and they were just separated by these little duct tape areas. And so she just had a, her fingers and she was just running her fingers up and down on the, and so they basically stimming. And I remember thinking, yeah, this stuff does feel really smooth and really good. And she was just kind of hanging out by herself doing it rhythmically over and over and over. And I looked at her and I looked at them. And to me, what she did was making perfect sense and what they'd seem to do seemed like really kind of loud and pretentious. And, um, but then I started thinking, well, if they're all doing this and she's not doing this, are they the weird one? Is she the weird one? Like what's mm -hmm. going on? And I wasn't sure what to do. So I went ahead and took her to the pediatrician and um, this pediatrician had been seeing her since birth and also saw my other children. And so we'd never, but I just kind of laid it on her what they shared. And so they said, she was like, hmm. So she did the M chat 
And then she, we got referred for all the different, you know, audiology checks and genetic testing and mm. this and that, and all the millions of things they try to do and speech, just try to see what might be going on with your child mm. um, to kind of, you know, assess things. And so we're going through this process. And meanwhile, I'm reading different things, you know, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. And um, as I started reading more and more um, the criteria of autism, I was like, this sounds like autism but I was kind of surprised I was like but I, I used to do that or I do this mm. or I do this or I do this like it was really confusing um <clears throat> for me because what I was reading as the criteria versus what all the message boards and um you know professional checklists for mm. red flags and warning yeah. signs were saying they seemed so different and so um <clears throat> I just, you know, I read through everything and I kind of thought about her and different things that she did. And um, so I assumed, I was like, she's, she's autistic. And so mm -hmm. by the time we finished going through the rigmarole of all the various different specialists and this and that, um, it was a pediatric neurology autism center that we were um, working with. And they, um, so by the time we went through all the hoops and, you know, everything, and they scheduled us for the reveal, you know, meeting, mm -hmm. uh, having done all of the check checklists and, and asking her, you know, physicians questions and so on, relatives. And they said, well, what do you think? And I said, I think she's on the spectrum. And they kind of looked at me and my husband nodded and they were like, they were kind of weirded out because they were like thinking no tears, no <laughs> preonics, no anything. And they were like, and so it's like the, the doctor, the nurse, the social worker, like all these people were in there and they were just kind of, and there was a student intern and they were just looking like, <laughs> and they were like, well, yes, you know, he is, you know, and then they gave her the autistic disorder um, diagnosis. And then they kind of explained, they, they gave me a hundred day kit, the old school mm. one, which was even worse oh. than, yeah, <laughs> um, than the current one. And they started talking about how we needed to do this, 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 and the other. And, um, and it was, you know, like for me, it was kind of, okay, it was non-committal, but I know that I've other in other circumstances from other people, they've been told mm -hmm. things like, you know, oh, I'm sorry. And I forgot that they mentioned to me um, at the time I was pregnant oh, <laughs> and they told mm -hmm. me that, um, you know, the, you know, there's a X, X, X percent chance that your, mm -hmm. your other child could have it too. And so it's like, and I'm like, okay. You know, like, so I guess I was too autistic to understand that I was supposed to be frightened. <laughs> so like, apparently this was supposed to be a moment where they all come in and they support us as we fall apart and we break into tears. And I, apparently I'm supposed to ask questions. Like those are frequently asked questions that she, they gave me. And, I, and none of those questions applied. So I kind of skipped over it. But later on, I was thinking, why would someone ask that? Like, is my child going to die? Um, what does this mean? Well, you know, like, and, like, and some of the, like the questions were questions that didn't make sense to me. I've been raising the same child all this time. So mm -hmm. this isn't like, you know it's not cancer you know she's like so okay so I have a name to what what's already there what do I need to do for her so I can be the best mom that I need to be for her and that's how it was for me but I realize now that um the way I, even the whole oh my goodness you're pregnant fear-mongering mm -hmm. uh, discussion or you know in other settings that I've been in um like I think about um the very first time I went to a parent support group and I was so excited because I was like these are going to be people who feel the same way I do about their kids and we're going to share ideas <laughs> and strategies with each other and we're not going to have people like staring and asking why your kid doesn't talk and all this weird stuff I felt like it was this huge camaraderie and instead they're sitting there like you know, the day that I got the diagnosis was like the day the Twin Towers, you know, were, were attacked and everybody's like looking all weepy eyed. And I'm thinking, you're comparing the day your child got this diagnosis to a terrorist attack? Like, mm -hmm. that's how devastating it was to you? Like, death, murder, destruction? Like, mm -hmm. I couldn't, the child that's right there in the other room playing, you know, like across the mm -hmm. hall. Like, and, and then people would talk, were saying stuff about it. They couldn't go, they heard their child would never do this. They should look into an institution, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. They were, be, better be careful because the, their marriage was going to be in, in jeopardy and blah, 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 this and all these different things. And, um, you know, that they were told, um, or that the way, it, you know, and I thought about the things that parents tell one another, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, my little one too, I fortunately do have one that's neurotypical, so I know what it's like to be a real mother, oh, like the things that I would read, oh. it was just really horrible, and I think only because I didn't know that I was supposed to be freaked out is why mine, my circumstance didn't go that way, like I didn't come in like, I'm like, okay, this, you know, like as if you told me she's got red hair, she's got brown hair, yeah. you know, this is a thing, what do I need to do, 
you know, my daughter had a, um, a severe food intolerance or, you know, or food allergy to rice, rice protein. Mm-hmm. And so we knew that we had to avoid all rice protein. And so that wasn't something stigmatizing. It was just something I knew. Okay. And yeah. it's you know, and, th- and that we found that out the very first time we get her rice cereal, which is supposed to be the safest thing for babies. Yeah. <laughs> Not that they have rice she intolerance. Had a, well, yeah. But she had reaction and almost died. Yeah, ended up in the, in you know, in the hospital. Oh. Yeah, so we learned. Um, so to me, knowing what your child needs or doesn't need is just part of being a parent. It's mm-hmm. informative. There's no value attached to it. And so, but I think that that's not the case. People um, adopt this mentality similar to that as if they're telling you about a terminal illness, mm-hmm. you know, and, and even you read the, you know, the information that people will share about the grieving process and the information they give parents mm-hmm. about grieving. And, um, you know, and it's really, I don't know, I feel that it's counterproductive because I feel like even I think about how, um, with cancer diagnoses, how they've changed the way that they used to tell you about it. Like now, sometimes they'll tell you it's a neoplasm, you know, or it's a bubble, you know, like, or they'll use terms to talk about the stages. Like they, they've, they're careful in how they deliver news so that they don't, people don't jump to the worst possible conclusion. Mm-hmm. And that it's, you know, they try to deliver it in a way that's neutral and fact-based um, mm-hmm. and point the person to resources. With autism, it's almost like hit hard, hit early. You've got this limited window of time to mm-hmm. undo this and fake them into this and you know without saying it that way and if you're any kind of a parent you'll do this if you care about any your kid at all you'll do this and Mm -hmm. and I think that um the whole um I I feel like parents are first of all I think they should be it should be made clear to the parent what what they're looking for like are you looking for just global developmental delay are you looking for a speech delay are you looking for autism do you suspect you know what you may not know but the parents should be informed. You shouldn't be going from specialist to specialist to specialist with these vague little explanations about what's going on and not knowing clearly and not getting, and then reports are getting sent to one another, but not to you. And the only reason you know what's going on is if you log into the in- internal portal and they forgot to check off whatever it's where you can't see it. Mm-hmm. And so it's like everyone is compiling all this information and t- discussing things to bring it all together to you afterward instead of giving you incremental information. And so I feel like parents are, they're, they're left to wait. Maybe there's a waiting list. Then they're confused and they're lost. No one's really providing answers. So that makes them more anxious. Mm -hmm. And then what they're told uh, essentially is that you're doing everything wrong. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do that. Mm -hmm. And so even a parent who knows very little about autism, just the way that it's it's, um, introduced into one's life with all this (laughs) secrecy and, you know, all of this, it's, it sets a parent up for, um, for failure almost from the very beginning. Um, and you are told that the things you're letting your child do or the things that your child loves are not, you know, oh no, if he, you know, oh, what is that? Oh, that's what he does when he's hungry. Don't, don't do that anymore. When he ignores, when he don't, you know, make him say eat or something, you know, like mm. don't, don't answer him when he does that. Or why is, why is he doing that? Oh, he likes to spin that. Well, don't let him spin that anymore. You know, like take that away or like, it's, you know, like, so immediately the things you are as a parent are doing, um, with, you know, are, the way you've already been engaging with your child is automatically just wrong and terrible. So there's the guilt factor. Um, and then there's the time factor of going to all these places that you need to go to and then the assessments and then the money factor. Mm-hmm. I just feel like in so many ways, we really need to reevaluate the way um, these things are done. I feel like how is a parent supposed to come in and feel empowered and feel like a, a person who can, who's you know got their child's back and on their child's team when from the very beginning you feel marginalized? Yeah. Absolutely. There's, I think, as, as, as you described, there's such a, um, like a giant cloud of fear, metaphorically speaking, around autism. And it is something that's often framed as like you need to act as soon as possible to make your child as non autistic as possible. Um, mm-hmm. And indistinguishable from the norm. Right, exactly. <laughs> I think that was the, um, yeah, that was the original. <laughs> Mm-hmm. intention and description exactly um and how i guess given that and given that i think most clinicians have also very much been trained from this mindset and most parents are approaching a diagnosis from this mindset mm-hmm. like if there's any clinician like watching this or or like reconsidering their approach what advice would you give to them for like how they can deliver a diagnosis in a way that doesn't perpetuate that stigma and that maybe helps parents who are coming in panic like develop a more healthy uh, perspective on their child. 
I think there's a lot of things that they can do. And I think it, it, it you know, it varies depending on the time, the type of provider that is, yeah. you know, giving the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully there's, there, you know, you've established a relationship with the family to where you can kind of get a sense are these people who need time to kind of for something to sink in? And should I mm. schedule a follow-up? Should I just share the information and schedule a follow-up? Or should I info dump with this family mm. and give them things <laughs> and come back? Or should I, um, you know, have a, a parent advocate with me, mm. you know, or a self-advocate if I have a volunteer in my class, yeah. you know, in my That's clinic cool. over here? Um, what, what should I provide? Yeah. You know, are there videos that, you know, this is person, a visual person, so, but sometimes you can't get a sense of that from the parent um, and, you know, or you don't have the resources. And so what I would encourage people to do is um, for the love of God, don't talk about it like your child's going to die the next day. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the tone of voice yeah. and the facial expression thing, you know, be neutral. Yeah. And, um, and I think that it's important to, um, even though I know that some people don't want to mention it because they don't want to, um, you know, like, I guess, um, accidentally send someone looking for something, but I think it is important to share, to dispel some myths right away yeah. with the parent. Because while mm -hmm. they may not have any, mm -hmm. generally they are probably going to come across some of those while they're looking things yeah. up, um, while they're looking up resources. You know, you'll come across credible things and you'll come across things that are far less than credible. Mm -hmm. And so if you aren't the one who tells them automatically about the biomed and that they mm -hmm. don't need to use commercial grade bleach enemas on their child and they don't need to, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. You know, put their child in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber and oh. have an elimination diet. <laughs> you don't tell them about these things. Then when they come across it, they're, it's going to be confusing for them whether this is real or not. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of give them a little bit, you know, of a, a little bit of um, a weapon against the potential snake oil salesmen that are coming their way. Um, you also, it also would be beneficial, I think, to have a, a range of different types of source, sources. So mm -hmm. I think like even the, like there are some things like, so um, there's some descriptions that some people have given of autism that are a lot more like, you know, objective than mm -hmm. the DSM-5, you know, criteria. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that people need, a parent doesn't want to read you know, restricted, blah, 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 <laughs> impaired, blah, blah, blah. You know, you can say the exact same thing in a way that's descriptive and that makes sense to someone um, mm -hmm. and isn't, you know, like a, a bullet, you know, to wound to their chest. So having some type of um, lay person friendly, you know, um, you know, description to let them know mm -hmm. about your child's disability would be helpful. Um, having some, you know, if they want resources, having some to give to them, um, sharing with them, you know, they can take their time. They don't need to take care. There's no rush. They, they, you know, like the whole, I think that a lot of people are panicked and forced into things that they haven't had a lot of time to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that that's fair to the parents at all. Um, I think that they should be told that this is the same child, that, you know, that you were raising, that you hugged and you got dressed and, you know, when, when they woke up this morning and walked into this office and they're walking out the same child, you just have more answers and more, have more information. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, um, you know, like there is actually a, a document that I had created and I'm sure there are others that others have as well, um, but there is a um um, a, a mother of an autistic teen, um, and Brenda Rothman. And so she has, um, she created like kind of like um, some narrative descriptions and it was based on DSM-4 at the time of um, characteristics of autism. And so, um, and so I kind of, I took that and I kind of used that as a guide and made a, basically I juxtaposed the way it's written in the DSM-4 versus with the more neutral descriptions and kind of so how you can see the difference between the two. And, um, and there are some resources, you know, like I, I'd love that if parents would, um, you know, if, if providers would consider, you know, the new 100 day kit, I will say, is better than the one that I was given mm. both times with my children, you know, 10 and, and eight years ago. Yeah. Um, that was, you know, this newer one has feedback and, you know, and input from autistic individuals in it. Um, but it's still, ultimately, I think so a, a resource like that should be written by autistic people, um, not by, not with input from autistic people. Mm. And so the, got something, you know, I think about how the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network has Start Here, um, which is a guide that you know, parents can download for free online on their mm. website or, or can purchase if they want a hard copy from, um, from Amazon. Um, there is also a tool being rewritten now by the Autism Society um, that gives some, some feedback and some guidance about diagnosis, autistic women and non-binary your network has some things um, that they've created as well. Um, and so does Foundation for Divergent Minds has a, a description, you know, basically this is a, you know, about what the disability is and how it, you know, um, 
you know, how it presents um, in a way that's not going. So I think that having some of these things would be helpful. Um, it's important, I think, for, for physicians, and not just physicians, providers to, to stay in the middle. I'm not expecting a provider overnight to just, um, you know, overwhelmingly embrace and adopt neurodiversity when they've been over here all this time. Mm -hmm. It takes time to evolve. Um, but I do think that it's important for um, them to do some research because most likely, you know, their perspective of autism came from a semester or two, uh, you know, in med school and mm -hmm. anecdotal things from the parents that they dealt with along the way and how much of it was informed by the autistic perspective yes. and, and, and particularly autistic parents. Um, and if the answer to that is very little, <laughs> then <laughs> I think they need to examine themselves. And then even on top of that, what range, you know, like what, what is the range of, you know, of families that you're seeing, you know, in terms of, um, their backgrounds and, you know, geographic location and, you know, um, their gender and so forth and age, because that also influences things. Um, and so, and where do they live, you know, so that you can get an idea of what, what services the child potentially might be looking, you know, might encounter later if the family can, you know, decides to seek services. Um, I guess it's just, I feel like it's really something that's probably not a, to be honest, in the purview of the provider. I think they need to have someone who's um, got more of a sense of like the socio-behavioral piece, like you know, a case manager um, or a navigator or someone, you know, to help them, you know, you know, holistically evaluate how this news needs to be delivered and do so um, because they may default on their clinical, you know, manner. And that's not always, that's not, not only is that not only what a parent needs, it's it's often not what they need at the moment. Yes. Yeah. I think something you mentioned uh, has, has also very much been, been my experience regarding how little of the diagnostic process seems to involve input from autistic individuals, um, particularly those with higher support needs. I think, you know, the criteria seem to be very much an external depiction of autism <laughs> um, yeah. and yes. uh, don't necessarily match completely the criteria of like what from what I've seen uh, of how autistic individuals tend to describe their own experiences um and then often like the recommended reading list that's provided also typically does not include readings that are that are written by autistic individuals or, or so on um yes and that's so frustrating because you know I think about how um you know like uh, just for me like even you know like even after like so you know obtaining my own autism diagnosis after that of my children and coming to understand different things about myself and um and and about my children and, and you know just growing and learning you know and then you know that actually prompted me that's what caused me to go to graduate school you know because I wanted to study um neurodevelopmental disabilities and so forth and learn more I felt like I was tired of, you know, being kind of like people kind of like looking over my head to each other and making cues. And, yeah. you know, I wanted to be informed and be able to help my children and not just be expected to sign the line and not question mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. Um, but I felt like I learned so much from my colleagues, uh, my autistic colleagues that, you know, that I didn't know even from my own experiences, um, because, you know, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm a part-time AAC user, you know, probably mm -hmm. every day um, there's times that I, you know, where it's, a lot more, you know, for me, it's better to type to communicate as opposed to speaking, but I'm generally, I'm often able, you know, to use speech. And so when I would, you know, some of my colleagues, you know, when they would talk about some of the experiences that they had, you know, in terms of people not understanding the receptive, uh, you know, uh, comprehension that they had and the things they'd say around them, or about some of the, um, you know, issues they might have with, you know, I mean, difficulty with, you know, uh, motor movement and yeah. so forth. And, um, and so um, I just started realizing that there were certain messages that people would, you know, like even autistic people would denounce, like, you know, mm -hmm. don't say we're locked inside our bodies. And I'm thinking, well, no, we're not locked inside our bodies. No, but for some people, there are aspects of their bodies that are difficult to control, you know, mm -hmm. you know and they shouldn't not be able to share that. You know, that's something that might be, that might need to be understood. There's a difference between a STEM, you know, that's, you know, one that's bringing you joy or, bringing, mm -hmm. or calming you down and something that you're doing because of anxiety or because of a lack of control. And so I think that um, it's important, you know, because of the fact that um, if it's a parent and they're dealing with, you know, these days people are 
your children are getting diagnosed younger. So it's less likely that they're walking into the clinic with their 16 year old, although it's not impossible, certainly not. Mm -hmm. But if the child, particularly if the child has higher support needs or is being identified younger, um, it's really, it's even more important to have the perspective of, you know, um, AAC users and uh, autistics with um, higher support needs who are able to share with what they've experienced because it might be a lot, it might mirror that child's experience a, a lot more than, you know, than that of, I guess, Temple Grandin or someone else that might be yeah. in a book list that would be given to parents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had, sorry, just going to take another question. This time. No worry. <laughs> just about, um, I think one of the other questions we had is just, um, I think we, we briefly mentioned this earlier, but there are a lot of uh, diagnostic disparities with respect to all kinds of access or aspects of identity. Um, and I think children are generally being diagnosed um, younger, but those disparities still persist. Um, and I've seen like a lot of research well, not, not enough probably, but some research on, on the disparities, but very little about kind of concrete steps to, to address them. Um, do you have any uh, kind of advice for uh, how, like, things that clinicians could do that would um, reduce diagnostic disparities other than maybe just increasing their own awareness of autism yeah. presenting? I'm glad you asked that because it's like, I'm, you know, it, it used to be, I'd be like, okay, great. I'm so glad that I'm seeing that people are recognizing that, you know, mm. you know, if, you know, people are basically not, you know, a cisgender, you know, boy or, mm. um, or non-white or what have you, that they're mm. you know, not identified as early and so forth. Mm. And so, so I was happy, but then I started realizing the trend is all of the studies telling us how horrible it is, how <laughs> delayed it is, but nothing, <laughs> no practice. That. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so some things I think, um, so a few things, obviously, like you mentioned, the, um, the provider educating themselves more is, is very important. Mm. Um, making their, um, you know, and I think making the place where you work, whether it's a, you know, a pediatric rehabilitation clinic, or whether it's a, you know, an educational center or psychological practice, whatever it is that you are in, making it more um, autism friendly to begin with. So look at your staff, look at your you know, decorations, look at the, you know, what is your place like? Do you have loud music coming from all over the place? Do you have anybody on your staff that's neurodivergent at all or openly so? Do you have any autistic people, volunteers even? Mm -hmm. You know, here, do you have, um, in your reading material, is it reflected here? Um, do you have, um, is your staff, you know, like racially, you know, in terms of gender and race and, and so forth, are they diverse or do they, you know, fall into one little category? Um, because that's an important thing. Some of those things are, you know, people can, are, are assist, you know, think people would have greater understanding of, of someone who has some similarity to them. Um, if they, if you have people in the, you know, in the, in your practice who, you know, are this way. Um, but in research is one area where I really feel like that we could make, that the changes could be made. Um, there, is, there is a tool um, that is, it's a um, newly devised tool actually that was um, co-created by um, two autistic um, re researchers and um, a non-autistic clinical team. And it's the, um, what was, I think it's called the um, self-administered autistic um, it has it. It's S A A T. I can't remember what T mm. stands for, but basically, it's the it's one of the first. There are tools we know. There are people have made checklists and ideas. There's tons of things that are floating around on social media, but it's the first, to my knowledge, um, mm. clinical tool that's been co-created with autistic people and the lead mm. that describes autism from the autistic perspective. Mm. And I feel like this could be a really helpful augmentative um, uh, tool, augmentative tool. I'm sorry to um, give to it was putting supplementary and augmentative together, but <laughs> um, to um, to help with diagnosis. You know, because I think that what's used currently um, the for screening and diagnostic um, you know purposes, all of them are externally created, um, mm. and you know. And so it, you know, to ask for a funder or whomever to accept something brand new when these things are validated, I understand it's difficult and probably next to impossible. But to, you know, have something to help inform it that mm -hmm. explains things from the autistic perspective um, in a way that's, you know, communicates the way that we communicate 
and um, and kind of captures our world and our experience from the inside out and not the other way around. Um, something like that I would love to see. I would also love to see, like in general, um, there are, I, I've been really happy to see um, that some research teams have been working to, you know, take certain tools and, you know, uh, make them more culturally competent. You know, for example, mm -hmm. the M chat, I know that had been working with some um, groups to looking at certain dialects that are in East Africa, for example, and translating mm -hmm. it there. And so some of these tools, I've been happy to see that there's been more of a partnership with, um, you know, with, um, you know, communities of color and so forth. And people are trying to get more, you know, um, women and non-binary individuals and trans um, individuals into research trials or as part of consulting teams to provide input. That's great if you really allow them to have the input they need to have. <laughs> like if, you, if you've already done all of this and, they, and they're only able to come in and ask, offer a few suggestions, like if they're not in on the ground level early mm -hmm. enough, if they're not given enough compensation, um, information, you know, and um, decision-making power to really affect real change, then, then their input might as well not even really be there. Um, and so I feel like there's a lot of things that are, um, you know, research design, um, you know, the, even like conceptualizing a lot of these studies that could be done differently. They're not capturing. So I, I think that there's, it's good. Okay, good. You're, you're reaching out to, you know, this racial group, but can you reach out to people in this racial group who are autistic? Can you reach out to people of this gender background who are autistic? You know, just don't take it, you know, take it a part of the way, take it all of the way. Um, because the, it, it will just really inform the research so much better. And so I feel like um, we're going to continue to, um, if we only, you know, if we're only measuring how, you know, how high something can fly and not how it can swim, then we're going to continue to miss people. And so I feel like uh, truly um, some things, you know, I'd love to see more. Um, I'd also see, I'd love to see more mentoring, like programs such as the, um, um, the um, USEDs and the LENS, um, I really feel like should, cap, should, should concentrate a great deal more on, um, I feel like the um, self-advocate um, and family faculty tracks should be a lot more center, central mm -hmm. to the curriculum um, and not just a part of it, because I feel like there's a lot there that they could, you know, getting, um, you know, early career professionals and graduate students educated early on is very helpful for the way that they're going to, you know, is the way their, their career is going to unfold. So this is a, it's like a, it's an opportune time to get them and to, to um, you know, to kind of, you know, positively influence them. Um, but, you know, one lecture a semester is not going to do that. It needs to be more. Um, and so um, kind of integrating, you know, that, I guess, like more of a neurodiversity informed, you know, disability justice um, adjacent a model into um, training, you know, programs is also helpful, um, and and into society. Like I think that you know, it's very interesting that when it came to with COVID nineteen, because it emerged and it was new, and there was limited information about it, people were forced to at least consider anecdotal things that people share mm -hmm. as opposed to just completely dismiss it. So when they found that some people were sharing things about their sense of smell or, mm -hmm. you know, Kawasaki disease, similar symptoms in youth or what have you that, that had not early, had been identified in the beginning, knowing of these things made people look into it more. Um, and whereas with autism, that's considered just noise, just junk data, right. yeah. you know? And so if we could, if we could have a mentality where we would kind of actually consider autistic people to be reliable historians, <laughs> <laughs> um, including the children, because they're yeah. telling us stuff. They're telling us a lot of stuff. They don't have to speak it to say it. You know, there's things that we can pick up from their their movements, their mannerisms, the the you know the lessons that they're trying to teach us. And so, if people would be more mindful of that, instead of just assuming um, this is a, avoidance, no, maybe they're trying to get your attention. You know, for this reason, you know, instead of trying to use always just the observable, you know, to explain the internal. Um, I think that there's a lot that we can do there. And I think we're way behind the times. Um, and I feel like it's almost like the situation where they used to talk about heart attack as pain in your left shoulder and tightness mm -hmm. in your chest. And if that's all people know to look for, then people mm -hmm. whose symptoms do not present that way, of which there were many, um, mm -hmm. could be in cardiac arrest without knowing it. And so we're you know, harming people by the lack of information. Thank you so much for answering. Thank you so much for, for talking with me again. I really sure. appreciate it. <laughs> I'll probably stop the recording now, but yeah, thank you again.